hello guys and welcome back to another video with this video we are going to begin with our video series on on electrodynamics right so what exactly is uh, electrodynamics to understand what electrodynamics is first you need to understand one of the most important entities of electrodynamics which is a charge right so what is charge charge is a form of energy intrinsic to some elementary particles right now you can see charge as something completely analogous to mass right similar to how everybody has mass everybody also has uh, not everybody has charge but there are a few particles which uh, have uh, this kind of energy known as charge okay so let's say you have uh, now charges unlike masses can be positive or negative as i have uh, mentioned in my first video uh, mass cannot be negative but charge can uh, be either positive or negative right so let's say if we have a positive charge and another positive charge right call this q1 and call this q2 then these are going to repel each other right they will apply a force on each other similar to how you have the force of gravity between two masses these two charges are going to repel each other right even and uh, if if we have two negative charges right and minus q2 then they are also going to repel each other they are going to apply forces on each other pushing the other charge away right and if we have another charge which is uh, let's say this time we have the q1 charge is positive and the q2 charge is negative then now but this time they are going to attract each other. so opposite charges attract and like charges repel each other right you should know that so uh, what is electrodynamics coming back to our basic question of what electrodynamics is so uh, given some charges right let's say we have some charges q1 or minus q2 and we have q3 q4 q5 minus let's say this one and these are positive right so given this charge then these charges may not be stationary okay these charges can have velocities and acceleration so let's say this has a velocity and this is accelerating in this direction and this one is stationary so v is equal to zero or uh, it is moving with a constant velocity uh, a is equal to zero right it could it could do anything okay so basically we know the position of these uh, charges as a function of time and now you bring in another charge okay you call it capital q where capital q is known uh, let's name it a test charge okay so capital q is our test charge so if we know the position of these charges as a function of time now see these charges are going to uh, attract or repel this charge let's say if this is positive or negative this could the test charge can be either a positive charge or a negative charge right so depending upon what uh, polarity or what uh, sign the charge has it will be either attracted or re uh, repelled by these charges right so q1 is let's say it is going to attract sorry it is going to repel uh, if we assume that uh, capital q is positive 
then Q1 will repel it because that is also positive. Right, Q4 will also repel because that is also positive. And they are moving, so the position, the distance, uh, the distance, the se of separation, right? If you call it this R, the separation distance so between capital Q and Q4 or Q1 and Q, they are changing with time because these charges are in general moving. Right, so the distance is going to increase or decrease depending upon whether let's say Q4 moves towards the capital charge or if it is moving away from the capital charge, then its distance is going to increase. The small r is going to increase, right? And hence, uh, because the force is changing, hence this capital Q will also be accelerated or it might move with a constant velocity similar to these charges, right? So these charges are known as uh, uh, what to call them, let's say call them source charge. Source charge. Right. So these are source charges and this is the test charge. So depending upon the orientation and the velocities and acceleration of the source charge, the uh, test charge is going to have either it is it might remain stationary or it might move with a constant velocity or it might accelerate so it completely depend upon the source charges and their motion okay and so this is our goal in electrodynamics to find the trajectory of this charge trajectory is nothing but the path which the charge has taken but due to the influence of the source charge. so we have to find the trajectory of this path of this test charge right and that is why we use electrodynamics. Given some source charges and they are, uh, how their position is changing with time, you can find the trajectory, which is uh, the path taken by the test charge. Now, now one of the very important uh, principles of electrodynamics is the principle of superposition. Right, so what is the principle of superposition? Uh, let's say you have two charges. This is Q1 and you have another charge Q2 and both of them are positive. So you know that these two charges are going to repel each other. Right, like charges repel. With some force, okay, let's call it F. Or this might be moving. Okay, this can have an acceleration or it might have a constant velocity. We don't really know, but it doesn't really matter at this point. Basically, what I am uh, want you to notice is that uh, this, is, this charge Q1 is going to influence Q2 and this charge Q2 in turn is going to influence Q1 in some way or the other. Right, they are going to uh, apply some forces on each other. Now, what if we bring in a third charge minus q okay is the force between these two charges going to remain f or is this q3 somehow going to disrupt this force and change this force to some other value right it can influence right this q3 might influence the force but that does not happen basically the print that is a principle of superposition that uh, we have observed experimentally that a presence of a third charge will never influence the interaction. The, any, the interaction could be anything, but uh, basically it is not going to affect any interaction between the charges Q1 and Q2. Right, so the Q1 is going to apply a force F and Q2 is also going to apply the same force on Q1 because Newton's third law, as I've explained in my previous video, uh, irrespective of the presence of any third charge right so the principle of superposition states that interaction between any two charges
is completely unaffected. Uh, by the presence of this. Right? Now it is not that Q3 is not going to uh, apply a force on Q1. Since Q3 is negative, it is obviously going to attract Q1. But this force is, let's say, call this F1 and call this F2, then F2 will not affect F1. F2 is exists independent of F1. And hence, again, if we have many charges, right? If you have Q1, if we have Q2, now these Q1, Q2, and Q3 can be either positive or negative. Okay, That does not really matter right now. But basically, if we have many uh, charges like this, and that could be Q5, Q6, and more, and we bring in a test charge, right? Now, uh, depending, let's say Q1, uh, uh, Q1 uh, applies some force F1 on capital Q. Now, capital Q can also be positive or negative. Depending upon that, this F1 will have its sign. Right? It might be, it can be like this along Q1 or it can be away. It doesn't really matter. But for now, we are calling it in general F, right? And then Q2 is going to apply some force, call this F2, call this one F1. Q3 is going to apply some force F3, right? And F2 is, presence of Q3 is not going to affect F1. Presence of Q4 is also not going to affect F1, right? They are, these forces exist independent of each other, right? So F1, the presence of Q1 will not affect F2. F2 won't become F2 prime or it won't change uh, due to Q1, okay? So you can write the total force on Q as the vector sum of the individual forces by the individual charges. So you can write it as F1 plus F2 plus F3 plus and so on, right? So we are going to use a Greek symbol here, which is our favorite symbol, sigma, right? I equal to 1, 2, and I'm going to say F1. So this compactly can be represented like this. Right, where you are summing. This means summation. Okay. So you are summing from, uh, let's say if there are n particles, then you are going to sum over this n. So if I will take first F1, then I will become 2, so it will become F2, then I will become 3, so it becomes F3 up to N, all right, up to some N. So if there are N test charges, uh, sorry, N source charges, then it is going to up to N, right? So this was the principle of superposition. Now, if in general the uh, source charges are moving, then it is uh, a bit difficult for us to analyze the uh, motion of the test charge. So first we are going to begin with the most simplest case, right? And then we are going to slowly move forward towards a more general case. So first we are going to consider the case of electrostatics. Okay, so what is electrostatics? In electrostatics, uh, we study the charges only when the source charges. In electrostatics, we consider the source charges. Uh, to be stationary. So source charges are stationary. Now that but uh, test charge could be moving. So one thing that you have to note is that the test charge might move.
right the test charge can move but there the source charges are going to remain stationary okay so that uh, study of electrodynamics is known as uh, electrostatics now we are going to study one of the most uh, important concepts of uh, electrodynamics or one of the most important laws of electrodynamics which is the coulomb's law So Coulomb's law tells us about the force between two charges. Okay, so let's say if we have a charge Q, right, and a charge, our test charge capital Q, then what force will Q exert on capital Q? That is given by uh, the Coulomb's law. Now here we are not making any assumption about the charge of these uh, of Q or capital Q but uh, we are going to keep it completely general okay so we are going to substitute the signs later okay so coulomb's law tells us that uh, f the force between these two charges is uh, going to be equal to 1 upon 4 pi epsilon naught okay small q capital q divided by r square and r cap flat okay where r is the displacement now you don't really call it displacement but basically it is uh, in this case a separation vector which is completely analogous to the displacement vector. Right, so R R is the displacement or the separation vector, which means uh, in a coordinate system. Okay. If we have uh, the charge uh, uh, small q over here, and we have the and these uh, give the position vectors of the charges is let's say this has uh, small r and this is capital R. No, I'll call it R1 and I'll call this R2, right? And this you you might remember from our video on mechanics that this is the displacement vector. But in this case, it is not that we have displaced the charge small q to uh, the point where capital Q is present. We have not done that. And hence, uh, this is although this is analogous to displacement vector, but it represents the separation between uh, small q and capital Q. And hence, it is known as the separation vector R, right? So the separation vector R is equal to R2 minus R. Okay. So this is the separation vector. And R cap is just the unit vector of the separation vector, which is very easy to understand. Okay. So this is the Coulomb's law. Now we have not substituted the charges here. If uh, Q, capital Q is let's say negative, then you substitute a negative sign. If, cap, if small Q is negative, you substitute a negative sign. If both are negative, then both will take negative and negative negative will get cancelled and you will be left with a positive force. Okay, so you can substitute uh, the sign, sign of these charges later. Now you might be wondering what this epsilon naught is. This epsilon naught is known as the permittivity of free space okay and why it is called the permittivity of free space we are going to look into that uh, in the future video basically um if we uh, have these charges not in free space. Free space means vacuum, by the way. Okay. So if we have these charges not in vacuum, but let's say air is present, or we have the charges inside the water, then uh, they are the forces are going to be different. Okay. The force between these two charges are going to change depending upon what material they are in. 
right if they are if i dip these charges in water the force is going to change between these two charges and hence uh, different materials uh, uh you know they don't allow let's say if in vacuum the force is four newtons then in water it might become two newtons this is just an example okay uh, so uh, in water it might become two newtons or uh, let's say in oil it becomes one newton so it's like that it depends upon the material the force depends upon the material and hence some material they don't allow the force to be mediated between the, these two charges they don't allow the force to like travel between the material in a, a complete way okay and hence uh, the term permittivity which means uh, uh, the permission right it's like permission uh, how much permission does a medium provide for the force to be mediated between these two charges right how permeable it is okay so epsilon naught in si units uh, has the value of 8.85 so this is equal to 8.85 into 10 to the power minus 12 coulomb square upon newton meters okay now uh, if you look carefully at this equation right have you seen something like this before yes this is completely analogous to our Newton's law of gravity, right? It varies as a, it is inversely proportional to the square of the distance between the two charges and it depends upon the product of the two charges and there is a, this constant, right? So this is completely analogous to Newton's law of gravity. Although some people claim that uh, Willem had copied this uh, a theorem uh, from Newton's law of gravity that is not true. Okay, Coulomb never copied it. He complete derived it uh, completely independent of Newton's law. Although he even he might be might have been surprised that it looks so very similar to Newton's law. And laws like this are only valid to the gravitational and the uh, electrostatic uh, theory. Uh, it is not valid to other forces. Now, someone might even try to copy Newton and Coulomb law and apply it to, a, let's say, strong force. You know that there is something called a strong force and there are weak forces. So, someone might try to apply to that, but it just doesn't work. Okay, but this one works very well. And it is very surprising that the Coulomb's force, uh, that is electrostatic force of our universe is exactly, uh, or I will say very, very similar to Newton's law, right? So how can I write Coulomb's law in simple English words? We can say that the force is proportional. To the product of the charges and inversely proportional To the square of the separation distance Another thing that you should note is that the force points along the line from a, a small q to capital Q. The force points 
along the line joining Q small Q and capital Q. And you can naturally see here, I've not made any assumption uh, about the uh, signs of the charges, but if I put a negative sign, then what does this negative sign imply? That the force is attractive. So if one charge is negative, while the other is positive, then the then, then the total force is negative, but that would mean that there is an attractive force between the charges. Whereas if both are positive, then this would be positive, the force will be positive. Then the force, you can easily see from the sign that the force becomes repulsive. And if both are negative also, two negative will cancel each other to become positive. And the force will again be a repulsive force. Right, so that whether force between two like charges are uh, uh, attractive or repulsive or force between two unlike charges are attractive or uh, repulsive appears naturally from the Coulomb's law. Okay. Now, what did we know from uh, our principle of superposition that F now instead of one charge, right, instead of here we have considered only one charge Q, but what if we have many charges, we have Q1, let's call this Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, and the separation distance, the separation distance between uh, Q1 and Q and uh, let's call this R1, the se uh, separation distance between uh, Q2 and capital Q, call it R2 separation between Q3 and capital Q, call it R3 and so on, right? Then we know from principle of superposition that this is equal to X1 plus F2 plus F3, right? Plus and so on. Okay, so now I can write uh, this uh, using this. Okay, where is it? Using a Coulomb's law, I can write it as 1 upon 4 pi epsilon naught Q1 capital Q upon R1 square separation distance. R1 is the separation distance between uh, Q1 and capital Q, right? Times some R1 cap plus same 1 upon 4 pi epsilon naught Q2 Q divided by R2 square R2 cap plus 1 upon 4 pi epsilon dot Q3 pi R3 square into R3 cap plus so on, right? So there could be several charges like this. There, let's say there are n charges, okay? Now you will see that 1 upon 4 pi epsilon naught and Q, I can take common from all this. So I will take Q divided by 4 pi epsilon naught common. And I will be left in my bracket with Q1 R1 cap divided by R1 square plus Q2 R2 cap divided by R2 square plus Q3 R3 cap divided by R3 square plus so right. And now I'm going to write it like this. Capital Q times a vector E. Okay. And here this E is R is known as the electric field. Electric field vector. which is equal to, you can easily see from here, I can write this entire thing, right? I just, just taken Q over here, right? The rest I'm going to, I've written as E, so E would be equal to one upon four pi epsilon naught, summation from I equal to one to N, 
right again using uh, summation notation qi upon ri square into ri cap right from here see so i can write it like this so that is our electric field vector now the electric field is something known as the vector field is a vector field what that means is uh, the it is a vector in space right if we have our coordinate system right and let's say we have a charge okay then there will be electric field around this charge right like this and each point in space due to uh, this charge q will be can be represented by a vector each point in space will have a vector associated with it. right similar to your temperature but temperature temperature is a scalar field that means if you are uh, uh, in india then your temperature could be something let's say 31 degrees celsius but if you are in the north pole your temperature could go below zero let's say minus 100 degrees celsius or if you are uh, uh, somewhere in the sahara desert then your temperature will go above this i'm just making uh, giving an example i don't know the numbers but could maybe let's say 42 degrees celsius so your each point on earth or each point on, in this space has some temperature associated with it similar to that if you have a charge then each point in space let's say the coordinate of this point is let's say this is a uh, one uh, uh, some random number minus one comma one comma two something like that i don't know but some random number is the coordinate then there may, might be a vector pointing in this way because of this charge this is the electric field vector let's say so each point in space can be associated with a vector and such fields are known as the vector field so what do we have from here f is equal to q e so i can write that uh, e is equal to uh, f divided by q right and hence the electric field is defined as the force per unit charge the force per unit charge that would be exerted on a test charge so this is the definition of the electric field as a force per unit charge right that would be exerted on the test okay now this is uh, just a very vague example of the electric field at this point this is just a mathematical formula of the uh, electric field right you, you have understood that electric field is such a vector field but does it really exist does the electric field really exist uh, you the answer to this question is much more complicated than you would think it is you know you you have this is one of the very deep i won't say uh, mysteries or question because this is solved but it is a very a deep concept of physics and at this point we are not capable of uh, uh, understanding that concept it because you have, will have to dive into not only classical electrodynamics but you will have to dive into quantum electrodynamics to completely understand what these electric field and the magnetic field you will have to learn relativity so a lot of deep knowledge of physics is required for that understanding but for our present purposes this definition suffices and knowing this is enough you know so that's it guys uh, 
in this video, I wanted to explain to you what electrodynamics is given thorough introduction and to explain the Coulomb's law and about the electric field. I will see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.